She goes into the next paragraph where she talks about a progressive testing process in the time of the Millerites. <coughs> and she identifies that those Millerites have gone through the testing process that they ended up praying, continuing to pray to the holy place and Satan answered their prayer. <coughs> the context of that passage is that 144,000 will go through a progressive testing process just as took place in the history of Christ and just as took place in the history of the Millerites. And that that testing process that confronts 144,000 will have to do with the foundations of Adventism. And when Jamal is pointing to the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians that are received by those that do not have the love of the truth, he and I and probably I think probably all of us understand that in one sense that's meaning a general disregard for all truth. But contextually, as he pointed out, in Second Thessalonians chapter two, the truth that brings the strong delusion upon Seventh day Adventists, which parallels the perfect darkness of the Jews and the Israelites praying to Satan, the truth that is not loved by Adventism here at the end. Is the truth concerning the relationship between paganism and the papacy, and more specifically, it's the truth that William Miller discovered in Second Thessalonians. It's the truth of the daily record, the book of Daniel. We have been making a case, if you go to Isaiah 28, that in the latter rain time period, we're suggesting it's a latter rain time period based upon verse 12. Verse 12 says, To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. We've been making the case that the rest and the refreshing here is the latter rain. And based upon this verse and several other passages, the latter rain is a message. This verse here, is identifying the refreshing. We've read quotes where Sister White specifically ident identifies the refreshing as the latter rain. And it's obvious that the refreshing here in this verse is a message because there's a group that will not hear. So refusing to hear means you're refusing to hear a message. And we are identifying that in Isaiah 28 here, that the technique for teaching the latter rain message is identified as being the technique for conveying the last message, the loud cry message, the latter rain message to God's people, conveying it to them through bringing line upon line together to illustrate particularly the end of the world. We've been doing that here this week with the reform movements and other approaches to prophecy. And in connection with Putting those lines together, we have looked at Isaiah 58, verse 12, which we understand is speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which Isaiah penned Isaiah 58, 12, because all the prophets are speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which they were living, as Sister White says. But in verse 12, placing it in the end of the world, it says, And they that shall be of thee. God's people at the end of the world are the 144,000 of the remnant, the final generation. And the 
hundred and forty four thousand that shall be in thee shall build up the old shall build the old waste places, thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And as we've been suggesting that Isaiah twenty eight is identifying the technique for conveying the latter rain message, as we've done that line upon line, we identified the foundations of many generations in order to identify part of what takes place among the 144,000 at the end. You have to return to the foundations. And it goes on to say, Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And when we deal with the paths to dwell in, we go to Jeremiah 6.16. And remembering that the refreshing in Isaiah 28 is a message that is not heard. Isaiah 28 is thinking about when? The end of the world. So when we go to Isaiah or to Jeremiah 6.16 to identify the paths that the 144,000 identify as the safe paths to dwell in, verse 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. And what did Isaiah say about this same time period? That this is the rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. And Jeremiah is saying, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. This is an a message that is argued against, it's resisted, it's fought against in Adventism. Um, and also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. The trumpet represents several things in Bible prophecy, but one of the things the trumpet very easily represents is a message. There is a latter rain message that confronts God's people at the end of the world, and in general, God's people take the position that they will not hear. Part of that message is a return to the foundations of Adventism. And we're identifying the connection with these reform movements, that every reform movement has a time of the end. And at the time of the end, there is an unsealing of prophetic life that produces the message of the hour for God's people to understand and for God's people to proclaim. But that prophetic light is also the truth that tests God's people. And we are identifying that based upon Revelation 22, verses 10 and 11, just before the close of probation, the light that is unsealed for God's people is the seven thunders of Revelation 10, verse 4, that is sealed up. Verse 10 of Revelation 22 says, Seal not the things of the prophecy of this book. Sister White tells us that the seven thunders represent two histories. The history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844, and future events that will be disclosed in their order based upon all the evidence we brought together. The seven thunders represent the prophetic principle that the Millerite history is repeated through the very letter in the history of the 144,000. And part of what took place in the Millerite history is that William Miller was used to establish the foundations of Adventism, just like the foundations are always established in the beginning part of these reform movements. The foundations that are established for the 144,000 are the return to the foundations of Adventism. And the way that they are established is that God unseals the seven thunders and when God's people recognized that the seven thunders represented the history of the Millerites, then God's people have, in the past several years, returned to the history of the Millerites to re-educate themselves upon the foundations of Adventism. They returned to the old paths, and once they got there, they realized there's a wonderful blessing in really understanding these lights, but at the same time, they realized that there are voices in Adventism that cry out, we will not walk there. And in defending the pioneer positions, we have identified that the foundational truths that are the platform and the foundation 
are the truths that are represented on this and this chart. I had a question from a brother um, here today, I believe, uh, maybe last night, and he, he asked, he, he says, Sister White says of the 1850 chart, she says, I saw that God was in the publishing of the chart by Brother Nichols, and I saw that there is a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And the brother came to me and he asked, well, where is the prophecy of this chart in the Bible? Because we know that this 1843 chart was brought about from Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12. And what I pointed out to the brother is that this chart and this chart are the same chart. Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12 are dealing with both of these charts. This is, as Brother Duane pointed out in his first presentation, this is an illustration of the progressive revelation, is that what you call it? The progressive revelation, the increase of knowledge that took, was taking place in the Millerite history. They came to this point um, after the disappointment. This chart is putting the capstone on that progressive Revelation, and so it's Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12 that identifies uh, this chart and this chart in the Bible. And when we return to the foundations and take up the work of understanding them, then we will find that we are also brought into the work of defending the foundations. So we have been in the past couple presentations and making the case, we pointed out Ten, I'll say nine, maybe it was ten. Nine different references where Sister White endorses the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. And then we moved into a very brief defense, very brief, there's more to say about the 2520, of the 2520 time prophecy. The 2520 time prophecy is represented over here on this chart. It's up in the right hand corner of that chart. And then we took up the work of the daily. You know, um, Sister White says in early writings, page 74, I was shown, um, I think I have it right here, it is. No, it's not in here. How's it going? Oh. Oh. Then I saw in relation to the day. No, no, that's not the one. Yeah, the, thank you for trying it. And I know this one. I was shown that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. So, yeah, early writings 74, but I wanted to quote it. I want some of us, we look at that and we say, okay, the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. And we say, that means that the truths that are represented on that chart have been directed by the hand of the Lord. If that's what you think, say amen. 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 I, agree. I agree with that. But some of us, we take perhaps the presumptuous step to say, the Lord was even in the graphical design of this chart. All right? That it was even laid out at his at his design, which you can make the case pretty easy for an Adventist because the very heart of this chart is the cross. Right? That, perhaps that seems like the Lord was behind that, putting the very center piece of this chart that way, as far as when you put it graphically when you're illustrating it. But I want to point out that at the very heart of this chart, too, is the daily. The daily is right here dead center as well. This subject here is a subject that just from the, the, the principles that are connected with understanding the daily corrective brothers and sisters, you cannot give a clear and concise illustration of the role that the United States plays in placing the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of the world if you don't understand the work that pagan Rome did in placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth the first time around. Because Jesus is the God that illustrates the end from the beginning. He's taught us how the papacy was placed on the throne the first time around in order that we will understand how it is returned to the throne. And we know the United States is the power that places it on the throne of the earth at the end. And when you understand the daily as the pioneers do, then you see the parallel of the work of Clovis, of the removing of the three horns, of the giving of the economic and military strength. It's all there. You pull the daily up. You've eliminated your You've eliminated your ability to see that part of the story and greatly diminished if not totally destroyed your ability to print the message. 
So where we started as we dealt with the daily, and what we're doing is we're giving a brief, and this is brief, details of some of the truths upon these charts, and the religion law was written in Hebrew. That it's, it, was, it is still very difficult for me. Um, if you would listen to the, the DVD presentations that we have, you'll find that there's probably 15 at the most Hebrew and Greek words that I deal with in the various prophetic presentations that we do. Maybe it's not 15, maybe it's less, I don't really know. But that's the only 15 I know. I only know them because they impact certain parts of prophecy that I have been forced to come to understand and defend. It's not like I'm a Hebrew scholar, so when I approach um, Rum and Sir and Kodesh and Mikdash and Chalzon and Mare, I'm just like you. It takes, a, it takes a little while to get those things straight in my head. It doesn't seem that way perhaps when you hear someone such as Jamal and I speaking about it, but you need to remember Jamal and I are speaking about these things on a regular basis. Um, if you take, this, take me, I'll speak to myself, outside of those Hebrew words, I'm a fish out of water just like everyone else. But we have to come to understand these things because if you're going to present this message, you will be challenged. And one of the places you will be challenged is on the subject of the daily. So we look briefly a little bit at the, the Hebrew, how to defend the daily, right where it's found in the book of Daniel, in the last presentation. <coughs> but there's also an argument about the history of the argument of the daily in Adventism. And you will find, from my human perspective, um, the same kind of work that the Catholic Church does has been done in Adventism. And what I mean by that is you will find that the history that's easily available about what took place in the controversy over the daily from 1900 till 1931, that history has been changed or perverted, just like the Catholic Church goes around and changes history. If you're going to come to grips with that true history, you've got to go back and dig, all right? And you, and you have to con be confronted with some, some hard choices on how you analyze certain pieces of information. But if you're going to deal with the daily, you're better off being prepared to understand some of these arguments. I have never sat down and counted the different points on the daily that get argued, but I do think that I am... <clears throat> Is where is I am as a, aware of the different arguments on the daily as there's very few people in Adventism that are probably confronted with these various arguments such as I am. I, I've heard many of them. I'm not lifting myself up. I'm just saying I've seen them. And until you, if you don't understand that, if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to defend the pioneer position of the daily, and you walk into the fray, you're going to you can suddenly find, oh, I never heard of that one before, and I never heard that one. But there is only a limited amount, okay? But you you hear them over a period of time. We're going to take up a, a few of those, um, not all of those. What page are you on? I'm on page 73. Mm -hmm. From Upward Look, page 352. The past 50 years have not dimmed one jot or principle of our faith as we received the great wonderful evidences that were made certain to us in 1844 after the passing of time. The languages, languishing souls are to be confirmed and quickened according to his word. Not a word is changed or denied. That which the Holy Spirit testified to is truth after the passing of the time in our great disappointment is a solid foundation of truth. The pillars of truth were revealed and we accepted the foundational principles, the foundation principles that have made us what we are, Seventh-day Adventists, keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. Have not the hearts of Christ's disciples burned within them as he talked with us by the way and opened to us the scriptures? Has not the Lord Jesus opened to us the scriptures and presented to us things kept secret from the foundation of the world? For me, Sister White's saying there, that the things we understood in the first 50 years of Adventism, they haven't changed. They're still truth. And no honest search of the records of from 1840 to 1890 will give anyone license to say that Adventism believed 
for the day that is Christ's sanctuary ministry. I came into history in 1901 to be reduced into history by Conrad, perhaps the most famous apostate in European Adventism. His influence in Europe not only brought about the separation of the Seventh-day Adventist Reformed Church from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but he created such a disrespect for the spirit of prophecy that virtually no Seventh-day Adventist in Europe have the spirit of prophecy. Even those that profess to be conservative Adventists over there have very few spirit of prophecy books. And famous quotes that we say among ourselves here in the United States that we're all familiar, that we just throw out the spirit of prophecy quotes and know automatically everyone's going to be familiar with it. You can say that in Europe with conservative Adventists, and they'll challenge you. Where is that? Did that bitch you really say that? And that's Lewis Conradi's influence. And in 1901, he introduced the view that Christ's sanctuary ministry was represented by the data. Um, next quote we've, we've looked at quite a bit. This is from early writings. Um, this is in the same passage. The paragraph before, she said that this chart over here was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. And in the next paragraph, she said, Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by, human, by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour to cry. Uh, the reason that I have review in here on November 1st, 1850, in these notes, is for an argument that comes up, an argument that was invented by Willie White, the son of Ellen White, and the argument that was perpetuated by Arthur White, the grandson of Ellen White. Um, and it's one of the arguments that's often used. Okay? And, and I'll tell you what it is, but we're going to get to it. I'll tell you what it is because we brought it up. One of the arguments is, is that when Sister White gives this endorsement of the daily, all she was really dealing with was time setting. But if you go into the complete article where this passage is taken from and put into the early writings, you'll find that Sister White was dealing with so many different items that for someone to look at that and say the only thing that Sister White was dealing with was time setting, it's it's not even close to being valid. It's you know, it's it's not close. Amen. Anyway. It comes from a passage that you have in your notes. Okay, we're going to deal with that as we move on. From Manuscript Releases, Volume 20, page 17 through 22. And I'm still on page 73. I'm going to take some snippets from an article. And this article you have in your notes. As soon as we get done with this presentation, you're going to have two articles, two appendix. One is this this quote. Now, Sister White says we're not supposed to use... Have you ever heard people say we're not supposed to use... Um, Sister White to define what the daily is or something like that. But she does say that, but you know how she says it? One place? You're not to use my writings as the leading argument in defending your position of the daily. And we didn't have, we're not using her statements here as the leading argument. The leading argument was what Jamal presented last time. He dealt with the Hebrew of Daniel 8. So now we're going to point out some of the things that Sister White said. And as Jamal pointed out last time, Sister White said, that those that gave the judgment hour a cry had the correct view of the daily. That tells you one thing. There is a correct view of the daily. Okay? You know that going in. And in Adventism today, what we teach in the universities to the pastors who teach the lay people, if they teach anything at all about the daily, we teach that it is Christ's sanctuary ministry, which is a Protestant understanding that pre-existed William Miller understanding and identifying the daily as paganism. William Miller, when he understood what the daily was and identified it as paganism, as far as we know, he's the first person in history that made that application. And when he made that application, he had to deal with two other views of what the daily was in the Protestant world at that time. One was that the daily represented Christ's sanctuary ministry. The other was that it represented the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem that was taken away in 87. But in any case, when Conradi in, introduced his view in 1901, he introduced the old Protestant view that, that represented Christ's sanctuary ministry. He taught it to Wagner. And uh, Wagner came over and taught it to Prescott and Daniels, and then it spread from there. But one of the points you need to understand about the subject of the daily. And I'm going to use Wagner as my 
my proof text on this, and you don't need it. Because when you start arguing about what the daily is, it's not so much about the daily, it's about the spirit of prophecy. Because you, you, if you're going to argue about it, you've got to argue about what does Sister White mean when she says, I was shown that the Lord gave the correct view of the daily to those who gave the judgment hour of God. And Wagner, of Jones and Wagner, Frank Fane, he knew what that man in early writing said before, and he was an honest soul, evidently, even though he was incorrect in his honesty, because he writes down that he can tell from early writing 74 that Sister White's endorsing the idea that the daily is paganism, and I know it, according to Wagner, I know that the daily is Christ's sanctuary ministry, therefore, Ellen White's a false prophet. And it was this issue where Wagner lost his confidence in the spirit of prophecy. So you need to know going in that the obvious, the obvious, one of the obvious things you deal with with the daily when you start pushing this subject in Adventism, it's about how you relate to the spirit of prophecy. And Daniels and Prescott came to understand Conradi's view of the spirit of the daily, and they began to promote this view. And it began to cause a shaking in Adventism, and the reason it began to cause a shaking in Adventism is because A.G. Daniels, he wasn't a newly baptized member that was a deacon in some small church out in the middle of nowhere, was he? He was the general conference president. So if the general conference president wants to push something, he's got all the buttons in Adventism to push that he wants to. But he was still in the minority. It was a minority view in that crisis. And that's, if you don't understand that, then you can stumble over Sister White's counsel, where when it comes to the subject of the daily, she says, silence is golden. She's telling them to keep quiet. And so you have people today that say, hey, people like Pippinger that are always bringing up the daily, he evidently hasn't read where Sister White says on the subject of the daily, silence is golden. Okay. Well, I have read that, but I've also read where she says when she's dealing with that issue that we're not supposed to agitate, agitate the subject of the daily under current situation, under the current um, circumstances, at this present time. She qualifies her statements with those, so there would be a time when it would be appropriate to discuss the daily. And if you look specifically at when she says silence is golden, she was using that in a general sense. She was saying to the church at large, let's just drop this subject of the daily. We don't want any confusion to come in here. Let's, let's take this meeting. Let's say um, there's someone here that's pushing the concept of God's holy name. Okay? That the message of the hour is that we have to say Yahshua and Yahweh. You've heard that perhaps in Adventism. And as those that are leading out in this, this meeting, uh, I look specifically at John. He's the one that's pushing this false concept in this little scenario. And I tell John, you need to be quiet. But in a general sense, I tell everyone else, drop the subject. Don't give, don't give John any opportunity to promote this, and don't be talking about it among yourself. We're going to be here for a week. Let's not let this subject sidetrack what the Lord's trying to do here. And that's how you can relate to her counsel if you look at it correctly, I believe. Amen. Is when she's talking about silence is golden concerning the day, and I'm not pointing any to John. I hope no one thinks that. <laughs> but John does not believe that. Uh, um, you look at when she's talking, makes a statement such as silence is golden, and if you can look, look up the original uh, sources, she's talking to Daniels and Prescott. She's specifically telling them, you need to keep your mouth shut. But she's telling the church at large, let's not allow this subject to simmer. Okay? So there comes a point in all this where she does write a manuscript about Daniels and Prescott. And it gets buried away. It doesn't come to light in Adventism until the time period that they start printing the books called manuscript releases. And I, I think those started getting published in the 1980s, 1990s. By the 1980s and 1990s, we've already fully drank the wine of modern, the modern view of the daily. So it's a dead issue. But in this manuscript, you'll see some of the excerpts here that we're going to read of what Sister White says about Daniel and Prescott's view of the daily, and it is documented that Daniel and Prescott's view of the daily is that it represented Christ's sanctuary ministry. So although Sister White is not to be 
the uh, leading argument on the subject of the daily, she says, on one hand, that those who gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily, and then she dealt with the counterpoint, that the daily represents Christ's sanctuary ministry, and she said things like this. And there was brothers Daniel's, whose mind the enemy was working, and your mind, and Elder Prescott's mind, were being worked by the angels that were expelled from heaven. And I was shown from the first. She wasn't shown long after the crisis and arguments started. She was shown, she was probably shown before Conrad even opened his mouth. She was shown from the first that the Lord had neither given Elder Daniels nor Prescott the burden of this work. Amen. Notice what she calls their work. Should Satan's wiles be brought in? Should this daily be such a great matter as to be brought in to confuse minds and hinder the advancement of the work at this important period of time? It should not, whatever may be. I have been instructed that the work of the Lord, that the work of the Lord resting upon the president is the most solemn responsibility. You had no moral right to blaze out as you did upon the subject of the daily, and suppose your influence would decide the question. Amen. The Lord will have to see in you a showing of different experience, for if ever men needed to be reconverted at this present time, it is elders Daniels and Prescott. And those who are hungry and thirsting after something new were advancing ideas so specious, specious, that Elder Prescott was in danger. Elder Daniels was in great danger of becoming wrapped in a delusion that if these sentiments could be spoken everywhere, it would be as a new world. Yes, it would. But while their minds were thus absorbed, I was shown that brothers Daniels and Prescott were weaving into their experience sentiments of a spiritualistic appearance and drawing our people to beautiful sentiments that would deceive, if possible, the very elect. Mm. Mark that. She's talking about the daily. She's talking about the wrong view of the daily. And she's saying that the wrong view of the daily could deceive, if possible, the very elect. Sounds to me like she's saying that the wrong view of the daily brings strong delusion on those who don't love the Trinity of the daily. I've had to trace with my pen the fact that these brethren would see defects in their delusive ideas that would place the truth in an uncertainty, and yet they would stand out as if they had great spiritual discernment. Now I am to tell them that when I was shown this matter, when Elder Daniels was lifting up his voice like a trumpet in advocating his ideas of the daily, the after results were presented. Our people were becoming confused. Amen. I saw the result, and then there were given me cautions that if Elder Daniels, without respect to the outcome, should be thus, thus be impressed and let himself believe he was under the inspiration of God, skepticism would be sown among our ranks everywhere, and we should be where Satan would carry his message. Messages. Set unbelief and skepticism would be sown in human minds, and strange mm -hmm. talks of evil would take the place of truth. Brothers and sisters, Sister White may not have given us specific details about what it means to take away the daily and who the prince of the host is and what sanctuaries caught cast down. But she did say William Miller was correct in his view of the daily and that those who went to Christ's sanctuary ministry used the daily have accepted that teaching from angels that were expelled from heaven. Wild mistake. Notice, underneath some of the things that we looked out earlier, William Miller was the messenger himself. In, in Jamal's presentation, he never pointed out that's fine, but if you can go back into that presentation, and there's a one-liner in there, boldface, that, that points back to an earlier thing that we had noted. William Miller was a type of Noah, a type of Moses, a type of Elijah, a type of John the Baptist. So when we're talking about William Miller being the man that the Lord used to understand the daily, it needs to be placed in that context. Angels guided William Miller's mind and opened to his understanding the prophecies. Angels of God accompanied William Miller in his mission. William Miller brought the message 
from heaven. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, it, we looked at this last time that this is this is the quote from Review and Herald where they're quoting William Miller and he is identifying how he came to understand that the baby was came in Review and Herald, January 1858. And uh, Brother Jamal listed off these pioneers that taught it that way. And this is the J. Dwight article, right? Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's another thing to note. This, this comes from a Review and Herald article in 1858, and the whole article is defending the pioneer position of the David. Okay, so this is uh, 15 years later. So Jay Dwight is doing in this article, he's reestablishing that way mark, he's setting it. Um, next page, um, the Lord gave the correct view of to those. You know, I'm, I'm, let me look. Let me look ahead. Just stay on the next page. Okay, I I don't see it. Give me a second. Um, okay, let, go back. To, keep your finger there. And go back to page sixty-seven, where I have a, a more complete quote from William Miller from this article in Review and Herald, eighteen fifty-eight. Where we were just at, I, I cut in okay. halfway through. On page 267 of the notes, under the correct view, under the subtitle, Miller's Daily, it says, I read on and could find no other case in which it, the daily, was found but in Daniel. Okay? Let me make this point for you, um, if I can. The word that is translated daily in the book of Daniel is to me. Okay, and if you take your concordance, you will find the Hebrew word to me, T A M I D, 103 or 104 times in the Bible. Okay? I think it's six times, five or six times in the book of Daniel. You can count it, but it's not a book. It's five or six times in Daniel, but it's 104 times in the Bible. 103, 104. And yet, did you catch what William Miller just said? He says, I found the daily in the book of Daniel, and I found that it's only in the book of Daniel. He's saying the word to me that's translated daily in the book of Daniel is only there, but I'm here to tell you that it's almost, I think it's 99 times used other places in the Bible. So how is it that William Miller is saying, I am not found in the book of Daniel? And brothers and sisters, if you're careful with the word to me, and if we, we can give you the chart, I have a, a chart that breaks it out. If you go through the 103 or 104 times that the word to me is used in the Bible, you can break it into like four sections. And three of the sections where it's most often used in the other books of the Bible, it's an adjective or an adverb or some other grammatical term that, that I don't know, that I can't remember. But in the book of Daniel, is the only place in the Bible that the word to me is a noun. So when when William Miller said, I only found this word in the big book of Daniel, he knew what he was talking about because, brothers and sisters, an adjective, an adverb, are different than a noun. You know? For me to have a baby cradle out there and rock the baby, okay, that's a verb. That's different than if I take a rock on that and throw it at the baby. But they're both rock, all right? But a noun and a verb are two different things. And it wasn't only William Miller that noted that. Sister Wright says it in early writings, page 74. She says, I saw that the word sacrifice in connection with the word daily was added by human wisdom and does not belong to the text. You know what that means? That means when the translators of the King James Bible were translating the book of Daniel, they came to the word to me, and they go, why is Daniel using the word to me as a noun? Everywhere else it's used in the Bible, it's a verb. Daniel, he must be making a mistake. So to make Daniel correct, what we're going to do is everywhere we see the word to me, in the book of Daniel, we're going to put the word sacrifice with it because then it's changed to a verb. The sacrifice becomes the subject, the meaning becomes the adverb. Okay? So even the translators of the King James Bible give testimony that they recognize that the word daily in the book of Daniel is totally different than anywhere else 
in the Bible. They had said, I'm not going to the doctor up to make it fit, but yeah. this is. And there's only one of the added words in the Bible that Ellen White takes the time to inform us was added by human wisdom and does not belong to the text. It is the word sacrifice. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, in selecting that, we're back on page 73. Um, um, 75. <laughs> the true meaning. This is one of those places your sister writes dealing with the data. I have words to speak to my brethren east and west, north and south. I request that my writing should not be used as the leading argument to settle questions over which there is now so much controversy. Um, in the next paragraph, it has been presented to me that this subject, that this is not a subject of vital importance. I am instructed that our brethren are making a mistake in magnifying the importance of the differences, difference in the views that are held. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken to settle, that settling this matter, the true meaning of the daily, is not to be made a test question. I now ask that my ministry and brethren shall not make use of my writings in their arguments regarding this question, for I have had no instruction on the point in the discussion, and, so, and see no need for the controversy. Regarding this matter, silence is eloquence. Is that what she said? Regarding this matter, under present conditions, silence is eloquence. So, so how how does someone like myself get around a statement like that? That this isn't of a vital importance. The way that you get around it, you don't have to get around it, is to understand that the message of the hour is the last six verses of Daniel 11. And the manuscript releases um, volume 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 13, page 394. Sister Wright has a passage where she says, um, I'm almost there. I can read it. Volume 364? It's Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 394. She says this. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of and the prophecies will take place. Now notice what she said. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. And brothers and sisters, Daniel 11 verse 40 begins by saying, at the, and at the time of the end, that's verse 40, and at the time of the end, in Great Controversy, page 356, Sister White says the time of the end is 1798. So when Sister White's speaking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, She's not talking about the first 39 verses because she knew the first 39 verses came before verse 40, and verse 40 began at the time of the end, which was 1798, which was before she was prophet. When she's speaking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, she's talking about the rest of verse 40 all the way to the end. Okay, so this is, she's not talking about verses 13 and 14. She says, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. She's emphasizing something. She's going to tell us something about Daniel 11. And she says that much of the history that's taken place, is, taken place in Daniel 1 through verse 40 will be repeated. And you can go in there and you can show histories in verses 1 through 40 that are repeated in verses 40 of 45. But she's telling the students of prophecy. In order to understand Daniel 11 correctly, you need to understand that history repeats, and specifically, some of the history of Daniel 11 is repeated in the fulfillment of Daniel 11. You follow my argument there? Okay. Much of the prophecy in the 11th Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved. And then Sister White quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11. Now get this. She's talking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11. In other words, the last six verses of Daniel 11. She says what you need to understand about that future fulfillment is that history is going to be repeated, specifically history within Daniel 11. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, and she says, then she says, scenes similar to those described in these words. Verses 30 to 36 
will take place. And in Daniel 11, 31, which is one of those scenes that's going to be repeated, you have the daily taken away. So when you get to the point in history which Sister White did not live, she was laid to rest in 1915. When you get to the point in history when the last six verses begin to unfold, then you need to be correct on the day. You did not need to be correct. You did not need to cause a shaking and a division within the Adventist church in the early part of the 20th century concerning the daily, because it was simply truth at that time. But there comes a point in time when the daily changes from truth to present truth because it's one of the historical representations that illustrates the last six verses of that. That's yeah. how you get around those kind of statements. And you have the license to do so because she says under present conditions. Now, um, next quote. Um, I have no light about time setting. The advocates of the, this is Arthur White from his six volumes of Advent history. Not, those are good volumes. I don't have, I'm not trying to badmouth those books or Arthur White. The advocates of the old view maintain that the wording of this statement, early writings, page 74 and 75, the old view meaning that the daily represented paganism, placed heaven's endorsement on the view of the daily held by Miller and eventually repeated by Uriah Smith. Right. Smith repeats it in the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, which Sister White says is God's helping hand. The New View advocates held that the statement must be taken in its context, the context of time setting. In other words, Arthur White here, if you look at it closely, he's repeating his father's position. His father took a position like this. Since his passage in early writings is simply dealing with with the phenomenon of time setting that was taking place by those Adventists that had rejected that the midnight cry was of the Lord. They were in the Millerite movement, but after October 22nd, 1844, they looked back at their experience and they said, this isn't of the Lord, and they begin to take those time prophecies that they've been dealing with, and they begin to reapply them to try to correct their error. And that was, that was one of the things that she was dealing with in early writing 74 and 75. But to suggest that that is the only thing that she's dealing with in early writing 74 and 75, it's just absurd. If, if, if a, an English teacher gave you the article where that statement was made and handed out and told you, you go through and you do a breakdown on this, and you tell me the different subjects that are addressed here, what's the theme of this, and you turn in the paper and said, well, all this person here is talking about is time setting, you're going to get it down. We'll show you why. <laughs> because we counted the different subjects she specifically addresses in this article. So anyway, Arthur White here is simply echoing his father's view. But Ellen White's repeated statements that I have no light on the point, and I'm unable to define clearly the points that are questioned, and her inability to make a definite statement when the question was urged upon her seemed to support their conclusion. Well, let me throw something in here. Sister White did make those statements about she had no light on the point, and I'm unable to clearly define these points. If you go back into the history, the person that was pushing these questions at her was A.G. Daniels. He wanted to answer, okay? But A.G. Daniels has put it into the record what he was asking her. You can read his statements. And if you go to Daniel 8, which I never remember these off the top of my head, but if I look at them, I can. What A.G. Daniels was asking her, according to him, I think we have this in the notes, but I want to at least point it out here about these references of Ellen White's on this subject that just been made. Daniels was asking her in verse 11, Who's the prince of the host? And what was taken away? And what's the place of his sanctuary? And what was cast down? Okay, he was asking him all these peripheral questions around the daily. And Sister Wright says, I have no light on this subject. He didn't go to her and say, Is the daily paganism? <laughs> he didn't go to her and say, 
Do you still stand by your position that those who gave the judgment hour cry were had the correct view of the data? He was asking her to explain the theological components in connection with the data. And I, I think we have some of his statements in here, so you will see what I mean. What are you saying? <coughs> loaded question. I, I'm saying that when you take her answers to those questions and you put them in this light, it makes it sound as if she's saying, I have no light on the daily, when in reality she wasn't being specifically asked about the daily. He was saying somewhat of his approach. I, I think he was trying to understand how, why his father, Willie, had taken that position, putting it in that kind of standard. Um, and you'll see a couple of quotes from the Bible. There are times when prophets are purposely silenced. Okay, the fact that she says she had no silent, no nothing to say on the subject, does not necessarily mean that she just the Lord can forbid prophets to speak. Is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, Bible the case study of context is important. This is one of the arguments that was first brought in by Willie by his son concerning this whole matter. W.C. White, after spending a day or two studying it through carefully, on June 1st, 1910, wrote Edson, taking the position that the context of the statement must be considered. The context of the statement, where she says that those that gave the judgment hour cry had a correct view of the day. It is evident from the vision of September 23rd, 1850, as published in early writings, new editions, page 74, under the title The Gathering Time, was given to correct the prevalent error of time setting and to check the fanatical doctrines being taught regarding the return of Christ. Now, now brothers and sisters, um, if you draw back, just I'm going to point it out to you. If you go to page 80, you see appendix to the notes. And it starts in the bottom of page 80. It goes all the way to the middle of page 83. And this is the article that Willie White says it's obvious that all she's speaking about is the phenomenon of time setting. This is all she's being shown, the subject of time setting. And therefore, we must consider her statement about the daily in that context. It's not about that they had the correct view that the data was paganism and had to do that the time they arrived at was correct and we needed to correct, correct, correct say time. If you read this article on your own time, I'm pointing it out to you, you'll see that Sister White deals with, she, you can see just by looking at the bold face, the first paragraph, she was shown in vision, I was shown, I saw, I saw, the next paragraph, I saw, next paragraph, I was pointed back, then I was shown, the next paragraph on the next page, I was enraptured with the sight. Two paragraphs down, I also saw, and if you go read those, she saw different subjects every time. She sees a whole variety of subjects. Uh, whether you look at ties to the messengers, and you just you read through it. And for someone to read this article and say that it's obvious that all Sister White was dealing with here is the subject of time setting. <laughs> If you turn that analysis of that paper into an English teacher, you're going to be an yeah. um, Back to page 76. I'm sure I'm running out of time, but I didn't look where I started. Did the, did the people running the camera have a time check? They're running 66 minutes. How long? 56 minutes. 56 minutes. 60. 66 minutes. I'm already six minutes over. Okay. So, I, on page 76, we can wrap this up quickly, perhaps. One of the arguments that comes up, I'm moving to a new argument. One argument I put in, put in place, and you can check it out for yourself, is the argument that all she's dealing with in early writing 74 is it has to do with time setting. It's a foolish argument. It doesn't carry any weight. It's not valid. No matter who put their endorsement on, even the prophet's son and grandson. Um, the, the Crozier article, shortly after um, the disappointment, Crozier came out with an article and Sister White recommended it to every saint. It was printed, it was reprinted because it was recommended to every saint. Her husband, James White, reprinted that article, I think, three more times. Right? Came out, 
So do I read it? She says, I recommend this article to every saint. In that article, Kozier presents the old positive view of the daily. But the reason that Sister White is recommending that to every saint is because he's got the first real clear view of Christ moving from the holy place to the most holy place, which God's saints need to understand immediately after October 22nd, 1844. As James White prints these, he prints the first one right away, just as it is. But then, when it's time to reprint because those are gone, he removes the false concept of the day. Okay? So when you come down to our day and age, you will be confronted with the argument, look at this. Crozier printed the false view of the daily in a document that Sister White says, I recommend to every saint. So your first, you're, you have some information here. One of the things you need to remember is that um, if you're going to take that position, which no historian in Adventism has taken until maybe the past 10 or 15 years, all the historians that wrote about this will tell you that because of the circumstances, James White just reprinted this article and got it out because the prophet said, get it out. But then when he had time to do editorial work on it, he removed the false concept of the daily and the next two times he printed it that year, it didn't have it in it. So they will tell you that that, that was, that James White was opposing the prophet, they'll, they'll come up with a lot of crazy ideas like that. But you know what the Lord did for us? Is in that original document, Crozier also had the false view from the millennium. He believed there was going to be a thousand years of peace. The age to come. The age to come, so it was called during that time period. And if those people are going to insist that, that Sister White was putting her endorsement on that first article in order to uphold the false view of the daily, then those brethren need to be willing to accept the age to come doctrine as well. It's obvious that no historian in Adventism has accepted that reasoning up until the past 15 or 20 years. It's obvious that James White just put that message out so God's people could see the first written presentation on what took place when Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place. It's only an argument that's been publicly raised here recently in a present day blog. As soon as he had time to do editorial work on it, he took that false view out. So does this article contain your statistic right now? No, I don't have the full, either one of the full articles. Um, I have the ones that he has in the Advent Review and the one in the Press too. Here? Here. And I did not bring the Law of Moses from the day dawn, but I have it at home. Yeah, I have all those at home too. Um, okay. They're on the CD ROM. I your CD ROM as a full article. The, the, the rest of this, uh, in the rest of these notes, I'm going to discuss, I would have discussed that I have run out of time. The interview with F.C. Gilbert and the implications of the supposed interview of Agent Daniels. But in, because I ran out of time, I'm going to recommend to you. The 2004 Prophecy School, if you're not familiar with this, because I'm sure that argument is on that as well. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we wish to understand this history where this controversy is taking place directly, that we know how to give an answer if we need to to those in heaven is that aren't understanding uh, this history and the subject of the daily. But from my personal experience, understanding the daily and its, its implications and its Hebrew is, a, is one of the trickiest parts of the prophetic message that you've given to us. I ask that you give us a, an extra measure of discernment and wisdom um, as we do test these things and try to bring them into our understanding. But it is clear to see from the prophetic word that this is an important subject, that we do want to be correct on this subject, and we do want to stand upon the foundation and the platform that you erected uh, during the history of our lives. It's clear that this is part of that foundation and platform, so help us to be faithful in that and stand there and not get off the free example that they have set ahead of the greatest group. We thank you for being with us so far in this uh, school. Thank you for breaking for lunch at this time, so we ask a blessing upon the food that you prepared for us and help it strengthen us and serve you with all of your better blessing and information that you're sharing with us here in Jesus' name. Amen.